I'm Bert Lancaster. I'm standing here on Mamayev Hill. Below me lies the city of Volgograd, formerly known as Stalingrad. In 1942, some of the fiercest combat ever took place in a monumental battle between the Russian and German armies. The ground was covered with bombs and artillery shells. Almost all of Stalingrad was reduced to rubble. Of some 46,000 homes and buildings, 41,000 were totally destroyed. In Stalingrad, two million soldiers fought for 200 days and nights. Many people in the West doubted that the Soviet army could win against the mighty Wehrmacht. But the Red Army fought the Nazis to a standstill, from street to street, house to house, room to room. Hitler's armies suffered their greatest losses to date as the Russians repelled attack after attack. It was the largest battle in history. So much was at stake that the victory or defeat of either side might well determine the outcome of World War II. Our story, the defense of Stalingrad. Soviet Union there are massive statues, monuments of marble, bronze and stone, testaments to the war that killed 20 million Russian people, daily reminders. Nowhere is there more evidence of the terror of war than in Stalingrad. The statues and the monuments seem to grow like trees in the city squares, in the forests of graves. Mamayev Hill is a pantheon where carved for all time is the name of every Soviet man, woman, and child who died in the Battle of Stalingrad. Some say 750,000. Others put the figure closer to a million. Everybody remembers. Nobody counts. This mother knows by heart the exact place where her daughter's name is carved. She can find it blindfolded cut in stone forever. der deutschen Bomben. Heer und Luftwaffe haben starke Kräfte zum Sturm auf Stalingrad angesetzt. By the spring of 1942, less than a year after declaring war on the Soviet Union, Hitler's front lines were a thousand miles inside Russia. Moscow was threatened. Leningrad fought on. Most of the countries of Europe had either been captured or had aligned themselves with the Third Reich. The Ukraine was gone. The Baltics and Belarusia had fallen to the Nazis. The great battles of Smolensk and Kiev had been lost. In January of 1942, the Nazi High Command had made an attempt to involve Japan in the war against Russia. The Reich, though strong, could use a second front. The Japanese would be the perfect ally. Japan's ambassador Oshima was escorted to the front. 
there he could see for himself the campaign-hardened Wehrmacht officers. This summer the Soviets will be crushed, Hitler had boasted. It's all but finished. While the ambassador was listening politely, he was thinking of his government's own war against America. Intelligence reports on every side were sketchy, while both the Russians and the Nazis prepared the spring and summer campaign. No one knew for sure where the Nazis would strike next. Stalin thought they would try again for Moscow. He knew the Nazis would not abandon their siege of Leningrad. On April 5th, 1942, the Führer issued his basic battle plans for that year's major campaign of force on the southern front towards Stalingrad and the Caucasus. The Nazis employed 74 of their 217 divisions on the eastern front, including seven armored divisions. These were the 1st and 4th Panzer Armies, a total of about 1 million men, supported by 1,500 airplanes of the 4th Air Force. His secret objective was a breakthrough across the Don and the Volga. He would seize the great oil fields of the Caucasus and Baku and open the way into Turkey, Iraq and Iran. The buildup of machinery, artillery and tanks went on endlessly. And of course more infantry. Some just in from Germany seeing the front for the first time. Late that spring, the Soviets struck at Kharkov, intending to retake the Donetsk industrial region. Unfortunately, the Soviets hit the eye of the concentrated German forces, massed for the drive eastward. Three or four Soviet armies were almost destroyed in less than a week. Now the Nazi summer offensive was well underway. warfare was being repeated. What the Germans couldn't pillage or carry off as plunder, they burned in their passing. If some of the old ones and children escaped death, they were left with nothing. The Unknown War will continue in a moment. Survival at Stalingrad. On the southernmost front, things were not going well for the Red Army. Fighting hard along the Black Sea coast and around the Sea of Azov, they were forced to retreat to the Kerch Peninsula. Kerch fell. The 
Nazi's main objective was Sevastopol in the Crimea, main base for the Soviet Black Sea Fleet. Sebastopol was a fortress. To reduce it, the Germans brought up special siege guns. In command was von Manstein, one of Hitler's most successful generals. In 1942, the Soviets abandoned Sebastopol, having withstood a siege of 250 days. by their successes at Kharkov, Kerch, and Sevastopol. The Nazis pressed on for Stalingrad and the road to the Caucasus. By mid-June, the Nazis had massed over a quarter of a million men with 3,000 pieces of artillery and nearly 500 tanks and 1,200 aircraft. Hitler told General von Paulus, commander of the 6th Army, with your army, you can storm the skies. Against this, the Red Army mustered 160,000 men, just over 2,000 guns and mortars, 400 tanks, and 450 aircraft. The odds were heavily against the Soviets. In the face of the Nazi advance, fighting doggedly, the Red Army steadily withdrew toward Voronezh. <laughs> Germans crossed the Don. Then they hit trouble. High Command had placed two infantry armies with powerful tank and air support within the Don Ben. General Halder, chief of the German general staff, noted in his diary, the enemy's resistance is building up. Two weeks later, he noted, hard defensive actions on von Paulus's northern flank. During June, the Nazis had lost 130,000 killed and wounded. In July, 160,000.
road to the Battle of Stalingrad. On July 28th, Stalin had ordered, not one step back. in numbers and equipment, the Nazis were still more than 60 miles away from Stalingrad. It would take them two months to cover the distance. In August, the Nazis lost nearly 260,000 men. In the summer heat of the Don Plain, the Soviets held fast, denying von Paulus the breakthrough he craved. The longer he could be delayed, the more time the Soviets would have to deploy their strategic reserves. And the more armament they would get from the factories of Siberia. The new aircraft. T-34 tanks. Guns. Katusha rocket batteries. Day and night they toiled. Westwood. Westward to the Volga and the city of Stalingrad. The Unknown War will continue in a moment. The defense of Stalingrad. The Germans poured fresh divisions into the conflict. At stake was the fate of the Caucasus. In June, the Nazis had attacked with 38 divisions. By the end of September, they had amassed 80. What had begun as an encounter battle had now developed into a battle of attrition. The irresistible force had met the immovable object.
Stalingrad itself had long since been put into a state of readiness. Workers from the great Stalingrad factories joined their militia groups and took up arms. committee declared each single one of us must apply himself to the task of defending our beloved town our homes and our families let us barricade every street transform every district every block every house into an impregnable fortress Stalingrad's tractor factory had been converted to wartime use. Its tanks went straight to the front. more and more men into the battle, on the ground and from the sky. Paulus's advanced units battered their way across the northern suburbs of the city and managed to reach the steep bank of the Volga. Von Paulus assumed that he now had Stalingrad in his grasp. Von Paulus's artillery could range from end to end of the city and his toehold on the river seemed to indicate that he could command the Soviet supply route. But when the column that had reached the Volga tried to expand its perimeter, the Red Army beat it back. What von Paulus could not know was that the Soviets had turned Stalingrad into one enormous fortress. called in the Luftwaffe to deliver the coup de grace. It was the heaviest strike the Nazi Air Force had made since the first day of the war in Operation Barbarossa. Every bomber that could fly was in the air above the city. They flew a total of over 2,000 sorties. It was a pure terror raid of the kind the Nazis had patented at Rotterdam, Warsaw, and Belgrade. Its intention was to massacre civilians and demonstrate the folly of further resistance.
Luftwaffe's high explosives began to pulverize the city, giving the coming battle its best known characteristic. Stalingrad would be a battle fought in a world of rubble. Long after the bombers had left, the flames still crackled. The terror raid had realized one of its objectives. It had killed the innocent, many of them, and wounded more. But the raid's other purpose, the breaking of Stalingrad's will to fight, had utterly failed. Sadly, the citizens salvaged what was left to them and left their homes. From now on, the streets of Stalingrad would be the province of the soldiers. The Unknown War will be back after this. The Defense of Stalingrad. The Luftwaffe's attacks continued, but with less weight against growing opposition. From now on, the Nazis were no longer bombing the defenses. The Nazis had 1,200 planes at their disposal. The Soviets, fewer than 500. the Soviet high command signaled the importance it attached to Stalingrad. It sent in Marshal Zhukov. Zhukov had never lost a battle. The wounded were sent across the Volga. Paulus was still extremely powerful. His 6th Army had reserves not yet committed, as well as five panzer divisions that had not yet seen any street fighting. September, Hitler told von Paulus, the vital thing now is to concentrate every available man and capture as quickly as possible the whole of Stalingrad itself and the banks of the Volga. Von Paulus was a man who obeyed orders.
September 13th, the Germans managed to break into the city proper. They were jubilant. Stalingrad seized. Goebbels announced the demise of the city named after Joseph Stalin. And medals were struck for the victors of Stalingrad. In the field, the issue of awards for valor was prodigal. The Wehrmacht was congratulating itself on its extraordinary achievements. They even started to build a new railroad, not realizing that the real battle of Stalingrad had not begun. soldiers who had won a great victory. The letters home were exuberant. Today I wrote to Elsa. We shall soon see each other. All of us feel that the end, victory, is near. For many of them, the end was very near. Davon geht die Welt nicht unter, die wird ja noch gebraucht. Davon geht die Welt nicht unter, die wird ja noch gebraucht. The battle for Stalingrad continued. The fighting took on a new character. Whereas previously the course of a campaign could be measured in miles, in Stalingrad progress was measured in yards. In one three-day period, the center of the city changed hands five times. The front line was behind every pile of rubble. The Unknown War will be back after this. The Defense of Stalingrad. Stalingrad was a general's nightmare. The streets had been so cratered and filled with debris that tanks could not maneuver. There could be little air support. Situations changed so rapidly that artillery was useful only at point-blank range. The lines were only a hand grenade throw away from each other, sometimes as close as different floors in the same house. Often the fighting was hand-to-hand. -hand. individual skills, quick eyesight, steady nerves, the will to fight and kill. It was unlike any other great battle that had ever been fought. Soviet soldiers of different nationalities fought off all attacks for 58 days. It became known as Pavlov's house. In honor of Sergeant Yakov Pavlov, commander of the group. 
In 1970, Pavlov told a story to people the age he was when he fought in 1942. Ivan Afanasyev fought shoulder to shoulder with Pavlov. He was blinded in the war, but doctors recently restored his eyesight. Here's the mill, Tamara. The fighting was particularly hard here. The Nazis repeated their attacks for days, and we had to hold out on this bank of the Volga. Over there, see that structure? They broke through to the Volga. We only had a narrow strip of land here. There is no land for us behind the Volga, said Vasily Tsaitsev, the sniper, giving Stalingrad a motto. Matvei Putilov, a signalman dying of wounds, put live wires in his mouth to re-establish communications. General Rodimtsev, a veteran of street fighting in Madrid in the Spanish Civil War. Rodimtsev brought his infantry division across the Volga to reinforce Stalingrad's defenders. His men were sent into action battalion by battalion as soon as they got off the ferries. General Chuikov's 62nd Army was becoming a legend. A German lieutenant wrote, The front is a corridor between burnt-out rooms. It's the thin ceiling between floors. There's a ceaseless struggle from noon to night. The street is no longer measured by meters, but by corpses. When September began, a German diarist had written, Are the Russians really going to fight on the very bank of the Volga? It's madness. At the end of October, he was writing, The Russians are not men, but some kind of cast iron creatures. They never get tired and are not afraid of fire. an oath over their dead comrades. We swear to the last drop of blood, to the last heartbeat, we shall defend Stalingrad. By the end of October, the city was cut in half. The Soviet positions had shrunk to a few pockets of stone nowhere more than 300 yards deep. General Chuikov exhorted, act more ruthlessly with your grenade, your tommy gun, your dagger, and your spade. Marshal Chuikov. Yes, I remember. When we stood at the last command point, our last command post was within 10 or 15 yards from the water's edge, I recall. It was very hard fighting between our 62nd Army, later the 8th Guards Army, and the Nazis. They had great superiority. Behind our backs was Great Russia and the Great Volga, Mother Volga. That was the ultimate goal of the Nazi attack. And at the same time, it became the grave for many of them. Mother Volga, a symbol of Russia's will, the river of her people's poetry and a source of their wealth.
little direct effect on the battle. The Volga flotilla made some hit-and-run raids on the German positions on the West Bank. It was aggressive enough to attract the attention of the Luftwaffe. Some of the German offensive had seemed bound to succeed until Stalingrad. By fall, the savage battle had shown that the German grand offensive was stalled. For nearly two months, the situation maps of the German high command had shown no change. November 6, 1942, the 25th anniversary of the October Revolution. Stalin broadcast. How can we account for the fact that this year the Germans still managed to take the military initiative and enjoy serious tactical success on our front? The matter is that the Germans and their allies accumulated all their available resources to throw them to the Eastern Front and to create on one sector of the front a great superiority. There is no doubt that but for these measures, the Nazis could not have achieved this success on our front. Of all the Red Army battles, Stalingrad was the one that tested to the utmost the capacity of the individual Soviet soldier. Stalingrad was the one that would determine the outcome of the unknown war. Our next story, Survival at Stalingrad. Through the winter of 1942 to 1943, the Red Army and the Wehrmacht were locked in an epic struggle on the banks of the Volga. It became the biggest battle of attrition in the entire war. The future of both armies was at stake, and the outcome of the unknown war. Wednesday on America at War, a history of fighter planes and the specialization of today's pilots. Now stay tuned for Cities at War, next on A&E.